Welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. I'm Eli. I'm Em. And I'm Lottie. And this week we're discussing everything about Beowulf. <laughs> and it's the first time we haven't had an author. I know it's a bit weird. Oh. Like by who? <laughs> it's a bit of a mystery. It, it, it's an entire and complete mystery. Nobody knows. <laughs> it's an open question in scholarship. Yeah, <laughs> nobody knows. Um, yeah, welcome to the podcast. If you're new, because we noticed we got some new followers on our platforms, which is incredibly exciting. Hello! Hello! <laughs> Welcome to our little podcast about books, which we don't review seriously, and we pretend to interview our cat and see what they think at the end of the <laughs> hey, episode. I actually read her Beowulf this week. She's actually consumed this media. <laughs> so this week, she'll actually be able to provide, in the form of meows, like, her view on books. But yeah, we're not serious. It's all, <laughs> it's all about fun. It's all about a good time and a fun time. Um, yeah, we hope you enjoy the episode. So normally we start with a terrible summary of the book. So what is your guys' terrible summary of Beowulf, the old English epic poem? I have a few. I have a few. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be an M episode. This is entirely their wheelhouse. Um, I guess mine is like, you're a good king and a hero for like 60 years and then you end up in hell anyway because dragon gold. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the ones I had on it was gold. It's good, probably. Uh, <laughs> I quite like um, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself doom your entire kingdom by getting eaten by a dragon. <laughs> um. <laughs> Gold, it's good, except when it's not. <laughs> yeah, like I kind of thought this was a bit of a reverse Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Like that in my, that was a mental <laughs> image in my mind because they Fair. had Viking slash Danish people in it. And mm. yeah, that's where my brain went. And that's I fair. will just say now I have loads of context-based questions about Okay, old that is the bit I'm least England. good at, but I will give it the good old college I mean, try. I, yeah, <laughs> I, just, I just have many questions. I mean, I guess, can you give it like a bit of a setting or background of like when this was written and kind of what yep. England was at the time? Because I guess... I mean, non-existent, basically. But <laughs> What was the political landscape of this island, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, right, where shall I start? Okay, so when we're talking about the context of this poem, there's two things we have to think about. There is the manuscript itself, because we only have it in one manuscript copy, like most of our old English poems, I think. Um, and Don't it's we one have of it in ones... slightly less than one? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's like point eight of a poem. Yeah, it was in the, um, the, it was one of the manuscripts that was in the Cotton ha uh, Library Fire. Mm -hmm. So it's quite damaged. Back up your data, kids. Back up your data. <laughs> Will you tell me what the name of the house that it was in when it when there was a fire? <laughs> yes, the Cotton Library was housed in Ashburnham House. <laughs> That's J.K. Rowling levels of, of like thematic you're naming. Just, you're just asking for your library to burn down, containing literally our only copy of multiple Old English poetic works. Uh. Like, just enraging. Anyway, f you, Sir Robert Cotton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we've got the manuscript. Um, it is a collection of a bunch of different Old English material. Um, preceding Beowulf, you've got like a bunch of other poems that are to do with monsters or like Old English things to do with monsters, like uh, Alexander's Letter to Aristotle, um, The Life of St. Christopher or Passion of St. Christopher, I think, and who's apparently gigantic. Bunch of other stuff. Judith, Old English Judith. That's a fun time. Um, and that is from like the late 10th to early 11th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that probably isn't, it's almost certainly not the first ever copy of Beowulf. You know, yeah. it's clearly been through manuscript transmission. Most people, well, everybody has argued for the composition somewhere between the 7th century and the late 10th century. Currently, I think we're sitting at like 8th or 9th is the general the general vibe. Here is where I should add a disclaimer that literally everything I'm going to say has been argued about so many times that mm. like... You will absolutely, anything I say, you will be able to find about 20 different opinions saying I'm wrong and here's why. Mm -hmm. So just bear that in mind, dear that listeners. That is kind of history though, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> <wrong opinion. laughs> I mean, yeah, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. 
This is one of the more controversial ones, maybe. But yeah, so that's the the broad broad strokes. We have a manuscript from the late 10th century, a poem that is probably from the 8th or 9th century. It's probably Anglian. Now, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. Kingdom stuff. Okay, so brief, brief and dirty history of Anglo-Saxon England. Um, so Romans leave. We're still like debating how catastrophic that was and how exactly that worked and all of that. Uh, Saxons turn up somewhere in the probably mid fifth century. By the time you get to the seventh century, you have kingdoms. The the seven that people tend to go on about, and I'm going to try and remember these and fail dismally: Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex, Essex, Sussex, East Anglia, ah, Kent, Kent. That's seven. I'm counting on my fingers. Um, and then a bunch of other like smaller entities. Um, eventually, mm. these will coalesce into the Kingdom of the English. That mm. I think is the 10th century thereabouts. Um, as as Lottie's pointed out in our summary document, there is a period where a chunk of uh, that territory is controlled by the Danes. Um, the great Viking army comes in, moves in, takes over a bunch of Mercia. And mm. the East, generally. It's like that bit in school and history where you do, like, in year seven or year eight, when you're like, okay, we did the Romans, Vikings, and then 1066. Yes. And, and yeah, I was basically. like, oh, Howard Godwinson. Oh, it's a Danish <laughs> name. Oh, this makes more sense now. But yeah, mm. we just want to explain that in school. So if you remember Vikings from school, it's like that. <laughs> they they Ish. sort of, they yeah, they, they um, invade the first time in sort of the uh, early to mid ninth century. Um, and then Alfred the Great kicks their butt. and So have right about the middle of the period when we think Beowulf might have been written. But yeah. like significant leeway either side, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, I my personal leaning is like before the Great Army, probably. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, like, that's a lot of being very fond of the Danes happening in this poem. <laughs> For someone that's just <laughs> invaded you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be a bit awkward. Um, yeah. And I think as well, one of the, the big consequences of the Viking attack was that literacy rates in uh, Anglo-Saxon England went down the toilet, at least according to Alfred the Great. Um, so you have this thing called the Alfredian Revival, where they're basically attempting to get people to be able to even read Old English mm -hmm. oh. anymore, never mind Latin. Um, so it's probably not from around that time period. Yeah. Probably. But yeah, so yeah, basically you start out with these about seven kingdoms and a bunch of other people. Eventually, and partially because of this Viking invasion, those sort of coalesce until you have a, what is more or less a kingdom of the English. And then the Normans come in and ruin everything, obviously. Um, yeah. This is the point at which I should also say that I don't care about anything that happens after the 10th century. So my ability to like give you any information on that is extremely flawed. I mean, <laughs> I mean to be honest, I just remember 1066... Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's yeah. that from the from the from the TV advert, you know. The yeah, <laughs> if you, if you remember that 1066 f everything over, you're 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 winning. You're winning, yeah. my son. You're winning. Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah. So okay. that's the that's the backdrop to this poem. Yes. Yeah. My question is which which translation translations did mm. we all read for this? I read the Tolkien translation because I love Tolkien. Yeah. Em has all of them, by the I way. I have. I'm literally <laughs> sitting next to a stack of seven different copies of Beowulf right now. Seven. Oh, Maybe eight? eight? Hold on. One, two, three, A significant four, part five, of the last seven. fortnight has been Em um, yelling about Seamus Heaney. <laughs> and his I, translation I of him. Demon. I, I, will, I, will, I will resurrect him purely to fight him. Is he dead? I don't know. Um, if, he, if he isn't, he's about to be. <laughs> I I read um, Maria Davana Hedley. I have probably pronounced her name incorrectly, and it's I. There's going to be a lot of that this episode. It's is fine. That the most <laughs> recent. Uh, I think uh, so. That's the one that starts bro, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's and, there's uh, an infamous word that goes at the beginning of Old English poetry, which is what, um, what? which nobody <laughs> really knows how to translate. <laughs> what. Um, so what? yeah, it's great. great. It sounds word. great. It's yeah, what? We're Yardiner and Yardigum or something. I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, but yeah, and it's, Tolkien it's, in true Tolkien style goes low, which is mm. inoffensive, right? Yeah, I think Heaney says so. We have low. We have so. We have listen. I personally am more of a fan of bro. I think bro is great. It yeah. is so good. It is. Uh, it was such yeah. a good, enjoyable read, and mm. the fact that like it. I don't know it because I hate. I find really, I struggle reading poetry with very archaic English in it, like very complicated mm. words. And this yeah. just felt, it 
it was so good because it transported you back to that. I felt like, oh, okay, I yeah. can follow the plot. I can follow what's going on. I still don't yeah. know what Agit is. That is a question I have. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, we could answer that. But it had just like... <laughs> Maybe I should have read that one. I read because the Tolkien one was pretty dense. And like, I like yeah. Tolkien. But um, yeah. one of the reasons I read it out loud to the cat was I was like, the only way I'm getting through this is if I read it out loud. Yeah. Like, I just love this. It's, I think it's line 980. And it's just translated hmm. as previously prone to cooling bullshit. <laughs> Unfirth, laugh, <laughs> son was, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, I love yeah. this. Oh, this like- is this is um Unfirth, right? And he's drunk, and he's like, uh, Beowulf, you lost a swimming contest one time, and <laughs> yeah. Beowulf's like, yeah, but only because I was at the bottom of the sea in full armor fighting monsters. What did you do with your weekend? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I particularly enjoyed um Davana Headley's description of Grendel as being <laughs> by fate. Yeah, <laughs> was, um, yeah, that's appropriate. I dig it. Um, yeah, I have read the Darvana Headley. I have read the uh, the Heaney. I got very angry about it. I don't think I've read the. T- I haven't read the Tolkien since it came out, which I think was 2014. I remember mm-hmm. enjoying it, but that's about it. And I also have my student edition of George Jack. Was it really as recent as that? I I guess I've always thought of Beowulf as being associated with Tolkien, but that's because of the lectures, not necessarily because the translation mm. was was. Published. Yeah, anybody anybody who's at all interested in further reading, um, Tolkien's The Monsters and the Critics is the place to start. It's like Gandalf is reading you literary criticism. It's amazing. I adore it. Can we add that to our list? <laughs> our long list. <laughs> I'm not sure episode. it's enough to do a podcast on, but... Um, <laughs> we could do a 20-minute episode. It'd be great fun. <laughs> it's very accessible, is the thing. Like, his era of academia is... We could yeah. absolutely do a podcast on, like, Tolkien's inspirations. Because, uh, like, one mm. of the things that I got, especially knowing that I was reading the Tolkien translation, was, like, how how much it read like it was from Lord of the Rings, almost. Yeah, Same. I yeah, definitely yeah. picked that up, especially with the gold and the dragons. But like Beowulf, mm. he is the main character. Mm. Can you give a bit of a, I guess, a backstory or a plot overview? Okay, so Beowulf is a bit of an incomer in the whole Germanic heroic. So Lottie had a question on our document about sort of the like, the why is it in, set in Denmark? Who are all these people? You know, what's, what's going on there? So you've mm. got this big kind of, I guess, mythology, uh, I'm going to probably be calling the Germanic heroic for shorthand. Yeah. That's kind of all the Scandinavian material. We've got a bunch of kind of Latin histories um, of like Germanic peoples in the 5th and 6th centuries. Um, a lot of Old English poetry. Um, some Old Norse sagas are set in that kind of zone. Yeah. So there's a lot of people in this poem that like, I think the poet is expecting us to already know about. Okay. Like, we should know who Ingeld is. We should know who Hrothgar is. You know, that kind mm-hmm. of... We should know who Sigmund, who slayed a dragon. Or is it Sigmund? Yes, Sigmund, yeah. Okay, uh-huh. right. So they're like people you... If you were read this poem or listened to this poem at the time, you would mm. know who those characters are. Yeah, it's almost like this- certainly. If yeah. somebody makes a reference to, like, Prometheus in, in mm. a modern... You know, we, yeah. we have yeah. the cultural... It's yes, part of the cult- exactly. cultural sort of background. Yeah, yeah, it's. I think in some, in many ways, it is comparable to kind of Greek and Roman mythology in that it's a big, it's a big collection of material from a bunch of different sources, and we Sometimes don't have all of it. And some of it's contradictory, and some of it's moving into history, and some of it's, you know, very literary, and some of it's very, you know, oral tradition, and it's all mm. a big grab bag of stuff. And the modern yeah. equivalent is probably like superhero universes, mm-hmm. where you just get this massive amalgam of different people covering the same stuff or overlapping stuff and it changes depending on what their like their current concerns are basically yeah so it's like the old english mcu basically (laughs) yeah basically um so people like hugelak um which is beowulf's boss boss man Mm -hmm. uh, turn up in other sources hrothka turns up in other sources we have a, a whole poem thereabouts about the fight at finsborough which is mentioned in beowulf um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's this whole kind of collection of, like, Germanic heroic material lying around that this poem is drawing on. Beowulf doesn't come up in any of those. Okay. This is the only poem in which Beowulf exists. Mm-hmm. Which is kind so, of weird now that you mention it, because mm, he's, mm. like, this super cool dude who is, yeah. like, rocks up and is like, I have the strength of 30 men in one hand, and I'm the best yeah. guy ever. Yeah. And like the first third is just him being like, yo, I, I'm absolutely great and I'm going to kill this mm. monster for you. 
and yeah. just like laying sick burns on anyone who contradicts him. And it's like at yeah. one point he's like, I can just beat this up with, I don't need a sword. I can just beat it up like, yeah. in a fight. And I'm like, and okay. And actually like the, anytime confidence. he does use swords, it tends to f*** up. So it's, yeah. Well, there's this whole thing about how he can't use swords because eventually he just breaks them because he's too strong. <laughs> <laughs> like he, his big thumb hands just crush the swords <laughs> until they break. Yeah. No, that that's pretty much it. So like the way where he fits into the like the kind of the material as it stands is that mm-hmm. he is related to Hugalat, king of the I'm going to pronounce this wrong I'm sorry Yeats Yeats okay. I want to pronounce it Yeats Yeats. because the, of the, <laughs> I want to pronounce it Yeats because of the potential for a this bitch empty Yeat joke that's where I'm at with it I would like to apologize to my old English professor I realized very early on in my like medievalist education that either I could pass all of my exams or I could learn to pronounce Old English correctly. Guess which one I picked, folks. <laughs> hey, they let you out with a degree, so it worked. They let right? me out with a degree. Yeah. They let me out with two. So that's, you know, clearly clearly, I was onto a winner there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so the Yeats are the people that Beowulf comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, they are from South Sweden. Um, they're one of several, like, Germanic people groups that we meet in this poem. You've got... Um, uh, Heatherbards and Frisians and Danes and Swedes. We get a lot of Swedes. And Schuldings and um, Wolfings. Yes, yeah. All with uh, uh, Waymondings, all kinds of fun and funky people names. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Beowulf is essentially invited by the Danish ki- Well, he's not invited. No, he's, he's not. He rocks he up. He's like, yo, I heard up. you had a pest problem. He's uninvited. You're right. He just shows up. He's just like, hey, bro, I heard you had a monster problem. Yeah, I can fix he's like, hey, you know, you. you know, my dad like like bunked with you while he was homeless once, um, and now you have, and now you have a pest problem. I'm come to like, you know, take care of that for you. And yeah. it's not even because he wants to like do a good deed, really. Or at least mm. that's not the vibe I got. It's because he wants to do this act of valor, like of mm, he wants yeah. to. He wants. He's like, oh, a big nasty monster for me to fight. Absolutely, I'm down. I yeah, just imagine yeah, yeah. like him turning up and like in Aragon when he opens the door. He's <laughs> like. Yeah, it's it's very much that vibe, yeah. I am here. I I have come to save you all from the monster. Ta-da. Oh, is- I thought that that moment is after he fights Grendel's mum and they're all just like, he's been underwater for 16 hours. Are we going <laughs> to leave and like and give him up for dead? And he just comes swimming back out, out of the water. Dragging a severed head behind him, as you do. Yes. So should we go over the plot of this? Yeah, probably (laughs) should, shouldn't we? (laughs) Okay, so I mean, one of my terrible summaries was an in-depth exploration of the futility of vengeance specifically and of mortal life in general. In the background, man fights some monsters or something? I don't know. And that is basically it. So there are are three monster fights. There is Beowulf versus Grendel. There is Beowulf versus Grendel's mum. And then 50 years later, there is Beowulf versus a giant (laughs) buff dragon. Yeah, I was reading it and it was like, oh, you know, this thing. And he goes back to Huyalak and he gives him all his gifts. And then it goes, and then Beowulf ruled for 50 years. (laughs) Just (laughs) one line. Time jump. This is one of the things where people argue that it's not one poem because they don't like that transition. if it... Yeah, I was like... because. Because I had not read this before, and the only yeah. bit that I knew was the Grendel and Grendel's mum bit. Yeah. And because the Tolkien translation is bundled together with Selic Spell, which is another poem, mm. um, I think, I was yeah. just like, oh, is this Selic Spell? Like, I didn't yeah, know no. it was part of the same poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, there's a time jump. <laughs> yeah, so there's, it's, it doesn't quite line up with where the scribes switch. So there's two scribes in the manuscript. One of ah. whom's going along correcting all the vocab, so it's like contemporary <laughs> West Saxon, and one of whom just left it as it was. But that doesn't quite match up with where people tend to feel there's a narrative jump. Mm-hmm. So there, people have argued for years and will be arguing for many more years whether it's genuinely one poem. And if it isn't, where does it? Where where are the the um, the taped over bits? Mm. Yeah. You know, I tend to think of it as one just because I think it's more interesting that way. Um, yeah. And nobody has satisfactorily proved that it isn't to my very exacting standards of because I said so. So it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's the basics. And then in and around that, there are lots of other stories, mostly from this like Germanic heroic that we, we talked about earlier, um, mm-hmm. that are sort of illustrations on a theme is how people yeah. generally see it. Like, it used to be that everybody was like, we don't know why this is here. It's really boring. Can we just have more monsters, please? Yeah. Um, and now people are like, well, actually, pretty much all of the other stories that we get told are to do with, uh, I guess, yeah, the cycle of vengeance and mm-hmm. how that and the fact that um, it doesn't work. Tragedy is inevitable. Uh, <laughs> everything, everything joyous is fleeting. 
Our age of the world will end soon and we'll be surrounded by the ruins of Giant's work once again. You know, very wow, Tolkien. Wow, I wonder if Tolkien basically. was at all inspired by this for <laughs> yeah. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's that's the kind of overall plot summary. I've got to say, not to get too bleak, but like mm-hmm. as a generation staring down the barrels of like a climate mm. apocalypse. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's one of the reasons I think it's so it's managed to maintain its popularity so much is because you can it's very applicable and it's one of the things that i like about the davana headley um interpretation that it's very much a translation of our time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know yeah. you like it's it's written with our like current crises in yeah. mind very much it, it definitely helped i think sort of contextualize it like especially you know mm. you're coming at it and i don't know the references to the other characters in the yeah. universe of this yeah um i mean to be fair they're heroes. all pretty obscure outside of beowulf that's the other yeah. thing so like they turn up in things like with uh, a couple of other old english poems and mm. it mostly mm. people are interested in beowulf mm. you know because it's it's the poem so all the other stuff tends to be fairly kind of yeah, most people going into it do not know who everybody is now. Yeah. And that was true. That was as true when I read it at the start of my degree as it was when I read it at the end. <laughs> but it definitely, <laughs> it definitely helped, I think, as someone who hasn't really read any epic poems or anything yeah. like this before. And it just made it that bit more accessible. It didn't feel yeah. like you had to have this deeper understanding to appreciate mm the poem and the story and you could follow the plot which is what i really liked about it and yeah um, yeah so props and i mean to be fair to heaney as well Mm. it that is one of the things but the few things he's managed to do with his translation that i agree with is that i think Mm. it you just get swept up in the story of it yeah it's very clear cut it's a workman-like translation you know Mm. so what what is so, so you, what 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 hmm. do you dislike about that okay. translation? <laughs> you want to oh, you want to go there? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. So the main problem I have with Heaney's translation is that there are a lot of words usually used for Grendel or Grendel's mother mm-hmm. that he translates in that are pretty neutral textually. Yeah, that he translates as things like demon or brute or savage. And that is very much not what the text says. Right. But they so, also used to describe Beowulf in places, right? Yes, yes. So there's a couple of different ones. So he describes... Uh, Grendel is described as a wicht, which just means creature. We get mm-hmm. that in the riddles a lot. And I think... What was the other one that was... Is that also me? where we get the term white, like it's used yes. in Game of Thrones? Yes, yes, it is, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, but it's, yeah, in, in sort of Old English, it's it's a fairly neutral, a living being yeah. term, right? And there's a couple of others like that which Heaney translates as demon or brute, one of which is unnecessarily Christian and misleading, I feel, because demons are a a different thing in in that kind of, like, in that um, time period. They're Mm. much less corporeal than Grendel Uh is. Like, Grendel is very much, like, made of meat. A lot of meat. (laughs) You know, there's this whole thing about him being descended from Cain, descended from like the giants that roamed the earth in genesis you know all of yeah. this he's very physical wait giants and- roam the earth in genesis yeah it's literally that's the literal there's a literal line it's there were giants on the earth in those days in actual genesis yeah hang on hang on hang on <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay i need to go back and read some more to now obviously yeah, it's a whole thing um yeah, we can talk about the the origins of the the monsters. That is a that is a whole a whole interesting um, other thing. But yeah, so there's those those neutral creature terms that yeah. I think Heaney gives an unnecessarily violent and or Christian spin mm. that just doesn't exist in the original poem. The one yeah. that people like to talk about most is Aglecher, which means kind of fierce assailant or you know formidable opponent. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's not neutral neutral, but it's pretty like people use it of bead. You know, like the Venerable Bede, Historia Ecclesiastica Bede, extremely angry about the date of Easter and not much else Bede, you know. Okay. Um, not a monster by anyone's yeah. standards. Yeah. They also use it of Beowulf. Right. But that is another term that Heaney consistently translates as things like monster, fiend, uh, devilish foe, all of that kind of stuff. And then it's used of Grendel's mother as well. Um, Can I just say that the the bit where I, I'm looking mm. up now the giants in Genesis the word yeah. is Nephilim that is not unambiguously giant 
No. That is from the King James Version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also, judging from sort of, uh, like, I guess, not really exegesis, but kind of the sort of extra biblical material that you get. Yes. Um, yes. People were interpreting it as giants. Yeah. Um, like, it's interesting. We're actually, at time of recording, the second mm-hmm. reference to Nephilim has just come up in this week's Parsha. Look at the Because oh, in right, Judaism, okay. we read yeah. portions each week, um, which is the 12 spies, 12 spies in Canaan. Right. Um, anyway, we're getting way off topic here. But, um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's really interesting. That's what this podcast is for. <laughs> Yeah, so like, yeah, I, and the thing is, my, my, my prob- I have two problems with it. Firstly, mm-hmm. I think it's misleading. Yeah. Secondly, they're already incredibly monstrous. Like, you don't need to over-egg the pudding. Grendel is literally eating people. Yeah. Like, people are getting torn limb from limb by this guy's bare hands. You really do not need to go in there with that. And I think it, it given that in the fight with Grendel's mum, Beowulf is described in similar terms to Grendel in being a a stranger to her hall, a violent mm-hmm. intruder on her domain. Yeah. yeah. Like they're clear like there are multiple instances in the poem where the poet is clearly trying to remove the distance between the hero and the monster. You're not supposed to be able to tell who is which. There are deliberate parallels being drawn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the ways that Mahini has mistranslated various bits of it are just completely removing that. Which I think yeah. makes it much less interesting as a poem and is like a fundamental misunderstanding of what the poet's trying to do. One, anyway. one thing is, you know, w- one of the ways that Beowulf's strength is is spoken of mm. is that he has the strength of 30 men in one hand. Yeah. And then later we get a whole thing about Grendel's hand after Beowulf has ripped yeah. the arm off. About yeah. how, you know, not, not with any like uh, steel made of men could you could you damage yeah. this and it's yeah. like very much what what strength is in their arm or whatever yeah you know um, yeah 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 it's it's very like it, there are moments in i think pretty much all the fight scenes where it becomes unclear who the poet is talking about whether they, he is referring to grendel whether he's referring to Beowulf, yeah. grendel's mum, the dragon and i think it happens often enough that i think it's it's reasonable to assume that it is a deliberate strategy on the part of the poet to bring us to question what monstrosity is you know yeah mm-hmm. yeah because because at the end of the day like what what beowulf is doing is like you say he's entering someone mm. else's home and just killing stuff yeah. for i'm realizing we never actually went over the plot <laughs> which, which is there's a really dope house and people have parties in it and these are people are the heroes and grendel mm. uh, keeps coming to like eat people from this house until suddenly it's not such a good house to have parties in anymore <laughs> and beowulf turns up and goes yo i can kill this dude for you and he does or rather he rips his arm off and then everyone's happy except grendel's mum comes back the next night and eats mm. a dude and yeah. so then beowulf goes to her house and which is yeah. under the ocean and um has to pick up a sword of giants from which she conveniently has lying around and kills her with it yeah mm. um and then everything's great and then 50 years later he fights a dragon and dies yeah, yeah, that is that is the summary. Um, but yeah, so like, one of the things I like about the Darvana Headley translation is that it kind of, it emphasizes the fact that Grendel was maybe there first. Mm-hmm. And you've got these kind of, the Danes have sort of intruded on his, on his Ash. landscape. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And built this hall and now they're having all these loud parties that he's not invited to. I'm not saying Grendel was justified in eating a bunch of people. But like, yeah. you know, there's a, it's a, it's not as, as straightforward as there's a random monster without any motivation that just happens to like eating people. Yeah. And the same is very much true of Grendel's mother. Like she is under sort of Germanic heroic social codes, very much entitled to try and kill the person who killed her son. Yeah. Mm. That is a completely mm. legit move on her part. Mm. Um, and part of what I think is supposed to make her monstrous to us is the fact that as a woman, she shouldn't be doing that. Like, that mm, whole episode okay. is surrounded by all these, like, stories about um, uh, Germanic heroic queenship and what that's supposed to look like. And it's very, like, um, making sure everybody's got a drink, making negotiation, diplomacy, mm. making sure that... Um, peace weaving, essentially. Yeah. And then she goes in and is just like, what if I actually solve my problems with swords the way all of you do? How about that, yeah. then? Yeah. Um, it, it was an interesting <laughs> thing that definitely mentioned i think somebody i can't remember mm. who married someone else and it was like mentioned they're going out and making sure all the men had drinks making sure that yeah. they had like food and and keeping mm. the peace between everyone stopping everyone having a fight and then you have yeah. grendel's mum and the um Devana headley introduction i thought was mm. really really good in yeah identifying those nuances um mm. 
because she's never described as a as a mon- as a quote unquote monster. It's just the things she does are mm. deemed to be monstrous. And yeah, she's described as like alien. I think right. Yeah. Or at least that's how Tolkien translates a, a word there. Multiple yeah, times. yeah. I think there is some some mysterious stranger type yes. going on. Yeah, I want to say Alwished, but I might be misremembering. She's um, kind of monstrous because, like you say, she's doing something that quote unquote women shouldn't do. Mm. That that's what it felt like to me. Um, yeah. So I was kind of like, well, I mean, she's yeah. His, I mean, but yeah, Grendel's a sh- but. Yeah, <laughs> like you say, I mean, he's her spion. Yeah, <laughs> like like you say, is if the Danes have come onto his patch, like why? Mm. You know, yeah. he, is yeah. he protecting his land? I don't know. It'd be interesting to know yeah. if there was there was other stories around mm. Grendel and his mum in the similar way you have, yeah. like, in, you know, that are I know lost to time, like explaining mm. what how that that scenario set up. Yeah, how so there's started. some stuff. There's there's a couple of I think there's some stuff in Greta's saga that's quite similar, which is one mm. of the um, old Norse sagas. There's a few instances that people like to point to as being um, similar, and uh, there's a few things in things like maxims where they talk about this. So there's some old English poems that are basically collections of like principles for how the world works. And one of those is that dragons guard treasure. One of them's that og- ogres, which is is a word that is used for Grendel's thus, um, okay, belong in their fens, which is uh, something else we kind of see in the poem. Um, gold is forgiving. That's another one. Um, so, like, there's we've got bits. Nothing that's like Grendel and Grendel's mum specifically, but there are echoes in places for sure. One of the things that kind of struck me on this read was this this sense of like. Uh, I don't know, I guess I'm going to call it a cultural anxiety, I guess, that you get in old mm-hmm. English poems. And it ties into the stuff that Tolkien really picks up on, that kind of sense of... At the end of an era. Yeah, inheriting a landscape that's full of ruins and knowing that you're going to go that way. That's going to happen to you, you know? Mm-hmm. That's going to be your civilization down the line. But also this sense of there being... I think, yeah, it's, it's because of Dov- Darvana Headley's translation that I'm thinking about this, but the Anglo-Saxons did displace people to that was an invasion you know that there were people living in britain when they arrived yeah and they very much got pushed to the edges you know uh, wales cornwall there's um, a couple of north british kingdoms as well um and i'm wondering if some of that anxiety the fact that they're 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 rewriting the history a little bit so Mm. oh we they were ruins when we got here and we have no idea who made them it was like this when yeah. i got here i swear not we burnt them down and we you know are like you know we took those over and someone might do the same to us you know yeah 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 or mm. you know those people are still out there and maybe we've got some anxiety about that you know but i don't it's difficult to tell because like as we were saying at the beginning like it's really hard to properly sort of contextualize the poem when we don't know when exactly it was written but like it's something that you get in other old english poems anyway is this anxiety around the landscape that they've inherited and the signs of previous civilization upon it mm-hmm. and like if they were so great why are they where have they gone two yeah. vast and trunkless legs you know yeah 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 very ozymandias yeah um it's yeah usually described as enter your work so like the work of giants which is another thing you see a lot in Beowulf is these kind of relics of a previous society. Um, yeah. Which is quite interesting. It's like still, because obviously that still happens, you know, like yeah. the, all the places that Britain invaded and was like, well, <laughs> there was no one here before. And it's like, no, there actually were. And you kind of got rid of their entire yeah. culture and their people. It's like, it's not just there was someone here before. There's someone here now and you're yeah. getting rid of them. And, it's like, there's, there, and then yeah, there's yeah, people yeah. there now and they're like, can we have our... Bi- can we have our bit back? It's like, no, we have a flag. It's like, no, like, you can't, like. <laughs> James Acaster's bit on that is so good. It's so good, yeah. If you haven't watched it, go and watch it on YouTube. But just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> find us, keep us. Just yeah. like. Oh. Did I ever tell you guys that story about. I can't remember where it's from now. It's like a, a 12th century or later Welsh manuscript that's just got a list of. They've come up with a bunch of place names in Welsh for play, things that exist in England, presumably for when they get to take England back. God, please! Any day now, we are begging you. <laughs> yeah, maybe when Arthur comes back and uh, yeah, you know, like, fixes everything. Um, <laughs> How, what can I do to hasten this his return? You know, <laughs> do we all have to start learning old English again? Because you know, <laughs> I'm okay with that. I for well, one welcome Welsh, our old probably, Welsh overlords. You know, yeah, 
Yeah. What, whatever, whatever language. <laughs> Better than know. the cabal yeah. of clowns we have at the moment. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway, that's the thing that like the, the Delvana Headley translation brought up for me that I hadn't really thought about. Because I don't really know what stories... And I don't know that there's anything really out there that talks about why like how the old the anglo-saxons thought about the people that were there before them other than Mm -hmm. the fact that you get all these poems where they talk about what are probably roman ruins yeah Um, well i mean how far do you think that the Mm. uh, presentation of grendel represents that he was here before maybe yeah it's Mm. yeah it's it's kind of it's difficult to tell but it's okay because he was a son of cain so we're allowed to rip his arm off well yeah 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 um like there's a lot of sort of yeah I, I I would be hesitant about about drawing a full thesis out of it just yeah. because again you I, can't. I, I'm you coming can't really at this from the very like I'm I'm a queer, so I identify with the monsters, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is uh yeah. That's this is that's valid. it. That's the entire essay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um yeah, it's something that yeah, like there's definitely anxiety in a lot of old English poetry about this sort of thing. Mm. And you don't yeah, like I said, there's not a lot in sort of, as far as I'm aware, in like Anglo-Saxon sources about what they thought about the people that had the land before them. Mm. And we don't, people, there's a lot of argument about how violent the Anglo-Saxon arrival was, um, mm. how long it took, what it looked like, how much sort of uh, interaction there was and what that looked like. Mm. So... Um, in that sense, it's quite difficult to 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 judge. I mean, one of the one of the things that's often brought up as being um, somewhat telling is the fact that there are maybe two Britonic loan words into Old English, mm-hmm. um, and usually that is a sign that absolutely no intermarrying is going on, yeah. and that either nobody, either either yeah, Britain was a vast untrammeled wasteland that they just rolled in on, or they killed absolutely everybody, yeah. <laughs> And yeah, we don't. We just don't know. Like, as, mm. as, as the state of research when I was last studying this was, nobody agrees on yeah. what exactly that looked like. Yeah, and there aren't very many. Yeah, there aren't any very many Anglo-Saxon perspectives on like what they thought had happened. Mm. You know, Bede has a little bit of a rant about how the Welsh didn't bother to convert the English when they showed up, and condemned them all to hell, and that was very rude of them. But Bede's. Bede's a weird little man. I love him, but <laughs> I just, he's, his priorities are, you know. Is that the angry Welsh monk? No, that's Gildas. Uh, <laughs> I get Bede confused. Is later. Me and my stem. But like, what I think that kind of mm. brings back to, I, mm. like the, I guess even the importance of literature, but the importance of like cult- cultural literature in particular as mm. a, you know, putting a mirror to, to society at the time, you know, any yeah. kind of literature, I think, and even historic literature, it's incredibly yeah. important. And as someone who hasn't, you know, at school, it was just, this happened. That's how history was taught. It was like, this happened. Yeah. And then we got to picking GCCs and I was like, I can't do sources. I went, I, I, I can't do history. Mm. And it, that, which is wrong. It was just, it, what, there was no mm. a, a nuance and there was no, uh, especially like with the, the history in particular, I'm talking mm. about like Vikings and Romans and yeah. like very early uh english mm. history or i say english as in like the uh the, the yeah. country the, made of this land a little bit you know. yeah yeah um you kind of just go okay well romans were a thing and then vikings happened and then mm. uh some normans came over oh and that's why we say the word beef um like it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of that was a sort of summary and it was just a whistle yeah. stop tour of this huge time period that mm. and, but like what were people at the time saying about it what were the exactly yeah. The, yeah. You'd, i think it would have been really nice at the, at the time like and this is just me talking in hindsight what would have been really nice mm. is if you could tie it into say okay you can read a bit of literature from that mm. time like there was no reason yeah. why okay yeah you probably couldn't give this to a 12 year old to like, like have fun but <laughs> it, <laughs> it, you, you never had that like real interaction with mm. the history and i think that's what this poem yeah. does is it gives you that link to yeah. hundreds and hundreds of years ago and yeah. you have that link to that culture and that society yeah. through the literature. And the literature. fact that someone at that time was saying, hey, the cycle of vengeance doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't get you anywhere. It's just, yeah, really interesting to me that I think now as an adult, I kind of have the time to be able to to, to do that research and to do that that reading. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it would have been nice at school if we could have 
had that introduced to us just just yeah. as a thing yeah, yeah. as a concept like oh by the way vikings okay you know it's not mm. just like people with pointy ha- pointy hats there's a whole thing <laughs> there's, there's that, a whole yeah. and then that was basically what yeah. it just it just dissolved like a huge chunk of history into like yeah people with pointy hats came on a boat from like denmark yeah. Have fun. And I mean, that's the thing where like some of the literature would be really helpful because I mean, there's, yeah. a, there's it's a poem by Alcuin that's talking about the, the siege of Lindisfarne. And this is a, a church guy who was in the court of Charlemagne, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And, but he came from York, is Alcuin of York. And there's he wrote a poem about the fact, uh, you know, the Viking attacks. And yeah. it's the saddest <laughs> thing, you know? Yeah. You get this real palpable sense of shock. It's something that, I think is the reason that I'm a medievalist and the reason that it's still something I love after all this time is the how much of it is still relatable. You know, some of it is completely yeah. alien and some of it is just so I guess human, you know, that you still feel it all those all all these centuries later, you get that kind of sense of people, you know? Yeah. And I think that's really cool. It is really <laughs> cool. Like at the end of the day, somebody wrote this poem. And somebody yeah. transcribed this poem, or two people transcribed this poem, and yeah. just you know, and then we lost a bit of it, and then, but now mm. you know, people can. I find it really, really cool that like you know, people in this day and age can read old English. I find it really cool you can yeah. read old English, so that's like really <laughs> cool. Old English is one of my favourites. I've got to say, it's just got such a good sound to it. Even though I'm saying this as somebody who fails to tra- to um, pronounce it properly most of the time <laughs> but it's, it's like it's like when people say latin is a dead language i'm like there are other languages you know guys and, and <laughs> you can still it's just yeah. all those things i feel that like, i don't know also just, latin is like it's it's dead but it also lives on in so many languages like romance languages, yeah. right yeah yeah, know, yeah, it's, yeah it's not i mean there's I, bits of it in beowulf like one of the words used for giant is gigant which comes from the latin yep. Yep. Oh, um, rather cool. than the sort of the more well, um, Germanic end then to Greek, Aeot and, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's but really yeah. interesting that when you <laughs> even just the language of it, because you know, at the end yeah. of the day, English as a language is just a load of languages put in a blender and whipped together. Yeah, pretty much. You know, there is no. I mean, I will just say this now: if English mm. is your second language. And you're managing mad to respect. understand this, like mad, mad respect, props. and also we apologise. <laughs> yeah, we, a, we apologise for probably using incorrect grammar, and secondly, mad <laughs> props because, yeah, I Jesus. tried to learn German yeah. that one time, and I was like, oh, there's all these like shoulds and woulds verbs. I'm like, oh, there's like six of them. It's very complicated. How many are in English? And it's like 24, and they're all irregular. I'm like, oh, okay, I can, <laughs> I, I can never, never complain again. Yeah, Sorry, a bit of a side tangent, but yeah, it's nice to be able to like read these different translations and different interpretations of the poem. Yeah, definitely. Uh, something that I, one of the things I really love about it is getting different people's perspectives on what they think is happening. And like every time I read it, I get something different out of it. And every interpretation, every article that I've ever read about it has given me another dimension to it. Mm. You really could just read nothing but Beowulf and Beowulf scholarship for the rest of your life and probably, well, I definitely wouldn't get bored. You know, there's like, there's <laughs> infinite, like, there's infinite possibility within it. And I think that's one of the reasons it's such an enduring, like, subject of scholarship. And it is something that people, you know, still read and care about um, and make because terrible of the, films of. Um, one of the things that occurs to me now, like, you know, there's so much, and, and this is one manuscript that barely survived, mm. but how many didn't that we'll never yeah. know about and you oh know. yeah that's a that that is a fun one that like do you ever tell you i had a i took an old english one of the exam papers so the the guy that did our old english course was a, it's a fun dude um and one of the things he used to do was you'd have the standard kind of uh, spread of exam questions you know you'd have something mm. on beowulf you'd have something on the battle of molden you'd have something on you know there's a bunch of things that pretty much always come up like the riddles or um Dream mm-hmm. of the Rude or whatever. And then the last Oh, the horrible question- riddles? Yeah. The, 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 riddles. the horny riddles, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the last question would always be kind of like a wild card question. Nice. And one year it was, apart from a lot of screaming and fainting, what would you expect the impact to be if we found another manuscript of Beowulf tomorrow? <laughs> and the answer is lots of screaming and fainting, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um... But yeah, it's yeah, it's it's so fragile. I mean, the Exeter book, that's the one that the riddles are in. Somebody used it as a chopping board. Uh-huh, yeah. what? Like the oldest Welsh written Welsh that we have 
um, has been trimmed in half by some Victorian bookbinder who was rebinding the manuscript. Yep. I want to cry. You know, and like, so isn't many... there the guy from the um, who like dropped the berry Bible or something, or like tripped over it? Quite what possibly. Was... I'm not familiar with that that's one. That's in the that's in the library that's hosted at Corpus or has oh been. the Parker yeah Parker Library. Love the Parker yeah. Library. Yeah, um, and the like the, the librarian is is or great. a librarian in the past has been like c- quite cavalier about the only copies <laughs> of certain extant texts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I. Actually, as part of my revision for my first year old English paper, my professor took us to the Parker and o- yeah, opened up the Parker Asnat Chronicle, the oldest like version of the, the as- Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that we have, and mm. was like, well, this, pe- this bit's going to come up on your exam, so why don't we translate directly from the manuscript? Holy sh! That's very cool. That is very. Cool. That is like so many levels of cool. Um, it was. It was yeah. badass. Yeah. I. I. But, um, I, I yeah. just thinking we should probably think what our resident cat who was actually oh, damn, are we there poem. already we are yeah. we are yeah. i'm just saying as eli read the poem to Gothmog, what do you think her <laughs> review of this book would be this book well poem? as soon as my fiance uh, showed their face who she mm. loves more than anything um she <laughs> completely didn't care about the poem anymore so uh, i feel like it was it was she she found it to be soothing white noise more than anything <laughs> Although she did, she did eventually curl up and 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 drift off to sleep while I was reading to her, so yeah. I think that's like it's that's like kind of the highest bit, sign. Of, it's like <laughs> yeah. the highest mark of approval that she could give something is falling asleep to it, right? Because that's her favorite yeah. thing to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there are no cats. There's, in there's it. killing. There's there's sharp claws. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sharp pointy um, things. There's a lot of murder. There's a lot of crime. Murder. There's crime. There is a dragon. I mean, the whole dragon thing kicks off because somebody steals from the dragon. So yeah, there is. Oh, we didn't even talk about the dragon and how clearly that influences some elements of the Hobbit. Oh um, yeah, yeah. The fact that the it, dragon it does, doesn't start basically. setting fire to anything until one thing gets stolen. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah. There's a dragon, which, as we all know, dragons are also cats. Mm. So yes. it, adding this to the long list of things we've done in this podcast that have yeah. got dragons in. <laughs> oh, man, um, I wanted to talk about how Dovanna Headley uses she pronouns for the dragon because that was really interesting. Anyway, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, talk about the m- monstrous and feminine mm. in, in Beowulf. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we should do a second episode on Beowulf later. Later on in the podcast. <laughs> Just talking well, about we could the do. Pronoun. We could do more uh, us reading different translations because I wanted to read yeah. the Devanna Hadley one. It's um, really good. Yeah. And I want to read the Tolkien because it's been ages. Yeah. Um, I mean, if um, you want to hear, yeah. hear more of us talk about Beowulf, send us an email, message, us DM us. It's like a bonus Tell episode. Us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of want to do um, Tolkien's inspirations and like talking about Tolkien. And obviously mm. that, that would dovetail really nicely with more Beowulf. So Yeah. 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 But Yeah. I think it's a fairly high rating from Gothmog, I'll be honest. I think it's a high rating. And it's not just that I'm biased by being a medievalist. (laughs) What do we think? Eight? Nine? I'd go for I'd go for an eight point five. There could be actual cats. Yeah, lack of cats. Lack of actual cats. I'm trying to we know that they were like they had domestic cats by then, right? Because there's a whole there's a there's a poem in the uh, the margin of an Irish manuscript that's just about a monk being like the cat has a much easier life than I do. Why is the cat having so much fun while I'm sitting here writing this manuscript? Ridiculous. What an enduring mood. I mean, while, while <laughs> we've been working from home over the last year, how many times have we looked over at the cat curled up and comfy on the sofa and gone, I wish I was you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just thought about that. I'm like, yeah, just our people dog. People are I'm people like, cats are cats uh, and they always have been. It's yeah. like, screw yeah. capitalism. <laughs> Let me be a dog. Yeah. <laughs> That that video of Hayao, Hayao Mazaki looking at the cat and being like, "You have no schedule. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. don't have to deal with the woes of life." <laughs> yeah. Can I jump in with a who would you guys yeah. fight? Because there's a lot oh of people. To, there's a lot of options for people to fight in um, this one. Unfirth. I would fight Unfirth. <laughs> That's valid. I pr- I pr- I can't pronounce her name, so probably that's it, okay. Go I think for it. I think it, I uh, who was it? It was like the guy who kept getting drunk and was a bit useless. That's Unferth. Unferth. <laughs> yeah. There we go, that guy. There we go. Oh, that no, guy. I'm, protect my, I'm weirdly protective of Unferth and I don't really know why. Well, I also don't <laughs> like Beowulf that mm, much. Like, yeah. he shows up and he's just really braggy. Yeah. And this one guy who's just like, yeah, but you lost this, like, tries to bring him down a peg. So, like, I, I, yeah. I get why you are protective of Unferth. Yeah. But also he ran his mouth and he needs to be corrected. 
<laughs> I mean, there's the yeah, the old English equivalent of a rap battle going on there. Yeah, about basically. Him. But yeah, yeah, I think there is some scholarship that's kind of on the lines of Unferth is kind of doing his job there. Okay. But I, I don't remember. I don't remember the details. But it, it's kind of like okay, some random strangers come in and is just claiming to be awesome. Maybe we should poke at that a little bit. Maybe we shouldn't just take that on face value. Yeah, like from a narrative perspective, someone needs to play almost like the devil's advocate. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Of, of trying to, like, yeah, yeah, criticize this guy. Mm. But um, yeah, I don't know. I sometimes I I would say Beowulf, but I would be I would just get pasted. It's not worth it. Um, I would fight the twelve guys or the eleven guys who didn't come to Beowulf's aid in the dragon bit. Yeah. But I would. But here's the thing: I wouldn't be able to fight them because they'd just run away. That's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to be fair, it's an easy it's an easy fight to win in that sense. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just um. Yeah. Just wait for them to get scared. You need and... to kill a rabbit. That's what you need, and then they'll run away from that. <laughs> <laughs> Big... Oh man! Just a version of Beowulf where the dragon is replaced by the killer rabbit of Kerbanog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yes, they've got big pointy teeth. <laughs> if you haven't seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, just ignore mm. that reference. <laughs> yeah. No, I go mean, and watch it. <laughs> oh, then go and watch it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got to say, I mean, I would probably fight Shane Mussini. Um Actually, That's I might fair. fight Neil Gaiman. I'm still like, I'm big mad about Oh, the, the movie. Um, we didn't yeah. even talk about adaptations and that's probably for the best because I do want M to be alive to record more of this podcast. And so. I d- every time it comes up, I do just start hyperventilating from sheer yeah, rage. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. <laughs> there, is, there, is there a single good adaptation, do you think? I mean... That's a no. Mm- Come on, that's a no. <laughs> that's that long of a pause. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I never read the Beowulf Dragon Slayer comics that my professor used to put the covers up. Honestly, that of, sounds like it in, might be one of the only things to truly understand the, yeah, <laughs> the source yeah, material. Yeah. Um, yeah, Given we no. were just talking about the you know MCU as, as comparative yeah, yeah. to the Germanic heroic. And I've got to say, Davana Headley is probably that. She actually wrote a novel called The Mere Wife that is a kind of a modern, I guess a modern AU, where mm-hmm. Grendel's mum is oh. a veteran with PTSD and Grendel's... Um, Part of the whole, like, the reason he goes on his rampage is that people are inconsiderately setting off fireworks and making a lot of noise around his war vet mother. Um, Mm. And I haven't read it yet, and it's been on my list for ages, but I bet that's a good... Yeah. That would be my recommendation, probably. I don't... There have been... There are Neil Gaiman short stories where he deals with stuff from Beowulf that I don't dislike. Mm. There's there's some there's some good stuff set in the American Gods universe that I quite like, okay. but then all of, all of my all of my like um, uh, general goodwill from that is utterly destroyed by um, Grendel's mum sleeps with every fucking character in uh. the poem, and all the monsters are you know products of the uh, sexy golden sequined Angelina Jolie Grendel's mother. Oh and yeah, like, like Grendel is Hrothgar's son, and the dragon is um, Beowulf's. Child kid with Grendel's right? mom, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not weird. And it, it's just non-stop shagging and uh, cheating and um, general. I was just like, did you read the fucking poem? My God. Also, like Grendel, Gren- let Grendel's mum be like ugly, please. Let her be old and gr- tired and monstrous. And- yeah, like much as I love Angelina Jolie, like. Yeah, like she's yeah. not sexy. That's part of that's part of the monstrosity. No, I mean Angelina Jolie is, but Grendel's mom is not. Even though yeah. the title of this episode is going to be Grendel's mom has got it going on. Oh yeah, yeah, but like that's the, with Grendel's mom. That's kind of because she's she's supposed to be a, yeah, like she's very much a subversion of the whole like it's a monstrous twisting of the, the old Germanic heroic ideal of queenship and womanhood. Like they're, yeah. they're literally, and we whether or not this is intentional, but like. Male pronouns get used for her on a regular basis. She is taking vengeance in a way that is a very much a male dominant. Anyway, yes, yeah, sorry. And sorry. consider this. She's all I want. And I've waited for so long. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Grendel's mum has got it going on, according that to That will be Neil the title and, of this episode. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> it is finalized. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'd fight Seamus Heaney. That's, that's my take on that. <laughs> um, so what other things have you guys been reading? I have been consumed with personal logistics lately. I've not done any reading. Oh, that's <laughs> not true. I read something called, what was it called? Oh, Everything is 
and it's by the guy <laughs> who did the the subtle art of not giving a f- and it was uh. about like the fallacy of hope and i'm not sure i agreed <laughs> with a lot of what it was saying but it was very oh interesting. yeah i remember this mm. and I, I was going read rebecca solnit read rebecca yeah, solnit yeah yeah <laughs> um it was i, I picked it up from the library because i was like we've already talked about the looming climate apocalypse etc etc mm. and i was just like okay i should like read some thoughts written by an adult about like coping with this and then it turns mm. out i didn't like them very much so <laughs> um so rebecca solnit is up on my next list mm. my next to read probably mm-hmm. but yeah I, I've been reading... I got addicted to Rivers of London. This happened about a week ago, and now I'm on my like second run-through up to book five. I'm halfway through the fifth book of that, which is Foxglove Summer. They're so good! They're so funny and so clever, and like the, the crime is so good, and he's clearly such a Pratchett fan. Like It's coppering in the Vimes mold, and it's just... ah, I adore it so much. Like I'm having a very good time with those. That would be um, good. But yeah, I, that's, that's I, pretty much it for me. I've been listening to uh, Stardust by Neil Gaiman. Ooh, uh, it's my yeah. recent audiobook purchase. Um, yeah, enjoyed it so far. I love the film. So I was like, okay, I want to mm. watch, watch, listen to this book. So Stardust is actually the first Neil Gaiman I read, I think. My aunt got me the illustrated, the Charles Vess illustrated one, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and that was it. That was my gateway I, I think I read pretty much everything he had out at that point after that. Yeah, um, it's definitely like more... I feel the film definitely sort of Disneyfied it a little, a just, yeah. a little, just a tiny, tiny little bit. There's so, there's a lot of blood and guts, as befits a Neil Gaiman yeah, novel. Which, Even if there's a lot of pseudo-Victorian gentility kind of pasted over the top. Yeah, I don't know why this surprised me given since we read Anansi Boys. Um, <laughs> but yeah... Um, also, I guess shout outs because we've had like lots of nice people message us and it's been quite nice. And in particular, <laughs> um, Book Addiction AU on Instagram have been very supportive of us. So shout out to you guys. Thank you. Their book subscription box service in Australia. Go check them out. They've been very, very nice to us. Just we haven't been paid for this for anything. They've just been generally nice people. So go check them out. Um, <laughs> and also just a nice, um, nice person who gave us a review on the american itunes whose name i cannot find at the moment i should have written it down but thank you <laughs> it's from months ago but because we couldn't find it in the uk one it just didn't come up and then we got a notification saying you got a review and i was like ah oh, that's so exciting and it was like let's two take this ago. opportunity to give a blanket apology for how bad we are at responding to messages uh, yeah we, we love we, you all they make our day but we're also among the most disorganized people known to man and we're terrible at communicating <laughs> <laughs> we're getting better we're getting better i think it's more just like the whole work yeah. from home yeah d- doing this as a side gig slash hobby and uh, mm. yeah genuinely if you send us a message it will go on the whatsapp yeah. chat we will all scream at each other and go oh my god an actual human likes our podcast it is yeah really full it, make, it makes our day and then we just forget to ever mention it to you we're very sorry but thank, <laughs> you. thank you dear listeners for just being generally supportive and if you enjoyed this episode um Next time, we are reviewing A Wizard of Ursie by Ursula Lee K. Guin. Is that how you pronounce her surname? Ursula K. Le Guin. There we go. So she's Ursula Ur- <laughs> Le Guin. <laughs> just like the dyslexic reading the names. So we're reading, we're reading the, the first book of the Ursula Quartet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, make sure to follow us on your podcast platform so you never miss an episode. Please like and review the podcast if you can on your podcast platform we are aware not all of them can do that we have twitter we have goodreads we have tumblr we now have pinterest uh <laughs> instagram all the social medias you can ever think of we're probably on it apart from tiktok because i, I no we're too old we we're don't understand old. TikTok. i'm sorry we're millennials it's, it's we're, the, it's the same t- reason that i can't touch the instagram because i don't it's too scary i'm too old <laughs> i don't understand it at all or twitter both of those they're too modern it's just too modern for us but yeah if you want to um, <laughs> recommend us a book to read or just say hello send us a dm on any of those platforms or you can ping us an email at teaching my cat to read at gmail.com the two being a to and yeah add hello there so we know you're not spam yes yeah, so say hello send us a message and recommend us some books to read big virtual hugs and we'll see you next time bye bye, bye.